I consider myself a very lucky person. I wonder how many of you people feel like you are also lucky? Because anyone who knows my story might be thinking, did she actually just say that she's a very lucky person? Because 19 years ago, I got the call that no one ever wants to get a little bit after midnight. The voice on the other end of the line said, I'm sorry, there were no survivors. I had just learned that my husband and two sons had died in a small plane crash. And I said, those were the most beautiful boys. And the caller on the end of the line said, I'm sure they were, ma'am. I'm sure they were. I'm so sorry. And my life changed forever. Many people have asked me, how did you survive? How did you go on? Well, today, about two, almost two decades after the plane crash, and the deaths of my husband and two sons, I'm here to tell you how I survived. I believed that I had a purpose, that I needed to make a positive difference in the lives of others. Now, one of the things that was very helpful to me was my family. My family of origin and Joel, Adam, and Seth. Now, this is a picture of my mom and dad. They're from New York City and Boston, and they met in the graduate program at Johns Hopkins, for people who were in psychology. When my father was offered a job at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, they moved. And my father, despite the fact that he said he never wanted to have any children, they had four. <laughs> and my mother said when I came out, I said, hi! And I was a very happy baby. And they called me Pollyanna while I was growing up because Polly Pollyanna always looked on the positive side of things. Now, my parents were psychologists, like I said, but they weren't the kind of psychologists that would let you tell them every feeling that you had when they would listen to you. They were behavioral psychologists. My father had worked with B.F. Skinner, so they used positive and negative reinforcement to get us to do the things they wanted us to do. And they had very high expectations for us. And guess what? We lived up to their expectations. You can see that my brother went to Harvard Law School. He is a dean of at USC Law School and on the police commission in Los Angeles. Andy is an orthopedic surgeon. My sister Linda had a PhD in criminology and she was the first scientist at the Centers for Disease Control and she did research in domestic violence. And I have a PhD in educational leadership. And I always tell people in some families you were just loved for who you are and in my family you only got love when you got an advanced degree. <laughs> but well, you had to go to undergraduate school, obviously, and Rob went to Dartmouth, Andy went to Princeton, Linda went to Brown, and I came out to Colorado College because I wanted to be a teacher, and they had a fabulous program for people who wanted to be teachers. So when I graduated, I became a sixth grade teacher. I have the arrow pointing at my head because the kids are 12, I was 22. It's kind of hard to find me in that picture. So, and now these kids are 52, and you can figure out how old I am. Well, while I was teaching, I got my master's, and then I was going to go to a PhD program. But meanwhile, I met my husband in a bar in Colorado Springs, and we got married, and quickly there came two sons. Adam was born in 1982, Seth was born in 1984. Now, before I met Joel, he was a playboy, and uh, really, once he got married, he just wanted to be a father, he wanted to be a husband, he wanted to have a wonderful life with our family. And here's a picture of us getting ready to go to the sock hop at school. And we just had love, fun, happiness in our family. Well, I was working on my PhD, the kids were going to school while I was having babies, working, going to school, and Joel opened a tennis shop, and we just had a wonderful life. Well, in 1990, I was an assistant principal at a middle school, and I felt under my arm one day, and I discovered a lump, which turned out to be breast cancer. So I called my mother, and I said, I, I have breast cancer, and she said, well, you know what, I think you need to treat this as an adventure. Well, my father had had can prostate cancer at age 55, and he had survived, so I decided I better think about what my mother said and then treat it the same way when I talked to Adam and Seth. So, it was a couple weeks before I was going to have a mastectomy, and we were upstairs brushing our teeth, and the most amazing thing had happened that day. Someone had broken into my car and stolen my car radio. 
So Adam was just talking about this. He couldn't believe this happened. And I said, well, you won't believe this. I have something even more amazing. I have these bad cells in my breast, and they are going to have to take it off. And Adam said, Mom, that is amazing. First they take your radio, then they take your breast. <laughs> and Seth, not wanting to be left out, said, but Mom, what do they do with all the breasts that they take off? <laughs> and I said, well, they put them in a room for men to come look at. <laughs> now, if I'd been a little more enlightened, I would have said, and women, but... But anyway, so what happened was they put in perspective for me. I wasn't losing my life. I was going to survive. It was a very hard thing to go through. I was only 38, but I was going to survive. Well, the night before my mastectomy, of course, Joel wanted to get in the act, and he says to me, I, I was actually sort of crying, and I said, you know, they're going to cut off my breast. Are you still going to love me? And he said, well, oh, sensitively, he said, they, they can cut that off, put it in my other breast. They can cut that off. But then he pointed at my in between my legs, and he goes, they better not cut that off. <laughs> so my whole family put things in perspective for me, which was very helpful, because putting things in perspective has really helped me in my life. So I had survived cancer. I felt incredibly lucky. Well, two years later, I was a principal at a small elementary school. I looked in the mirror on the very last day of school and saw another lump. This lump was all malignant cells. It was treated as a stage four cancer. I had chemo. I had radiation. I had a hysterectomy, but I would have chemo on Thursday, get sick over the weekend, go back to work on Monday because I wanted to model for the kids that I would be able to survive this too. But of course, I lost my hair, all my hair. Here I am with my wig. Here I am without any hair. And here my family is making fun of me. <laughs> so when you lose your hair, at least when I lost my hair, I lost hair on my head, everywhere all over my body. I got out of the shower one day. Of course, Seth looks at me and goes, hey, mom, is that what you looked like when you were a girl? <laughs> like, yeah, Seth. So anyway, I did survive that cancer and felt just incredibly lucky to have survived both times having cancer. So now we just went back to our regular life. Joel had a tennis shop, so the boys were very active and played hockey, because you know that works. Your dad has a tennis shop, so you play hockey. But anyway, they also played tennis. And um, I was the principal and working hard. The kids uh, were at my school. Well, in 1995, Joel told me that he wanted to go watch the Davis Cup tennis tournament in Las Vegas, and he was going to take Adam and Seth. A friend was going to fly them in a private plane. And I said, I was working, and I said, great. I realized it was going to be Seth's 11th birthday, so I made a uh, reservation for a commercial flight. They flew on a, the small plane to Las Vegas. I flew later in the day and met them. We had this amazing, love-filled weekend. So um, we just had a great time. And then the day that we were leaving was Sunday morning, and I was walking down the street with him. I had Adam on one side, I had Seth on the other side, and we just came up to the crosswalk. And I said, I love you, and kissed each boy. And then Joel came over and kissed me, and he said, I love you. He walked into the crosswalk, and he said, I love you, be careful. And I looked at him, and I said, I love you, you be careful. Then I flew home into bad weather, went to school and started working. It was a Sunday, and Joel had left me a message, and he said, we're getting on the plane. It's about 3.30. We should be home about 7.15. So I started checking the messages because this was before cell phones. There were no messages at home, so I just kept working. Well, finally, about 9 o'clock, I thought, well, I'm going to go home. Maybe they got home, and I just missed them. But they weren't home, but about 10 o'clock, the phone rang, and it was somebody who said, I, I need to tell you that we have a couple of planes down in Colorado. And I said, do you know something? He said, um, no, we don't. But we were waiting for some coordinates to pass and we'll, from the satellite, and we'll be able to check out the planes and let you know. We'll call you after midnight. And he said, um, are you religious? I said, no, not really. Why? And he said, because I want somebody to be sitting with you. So I called my best friend Donna, and she came over, and we just talked and kind of distracted ourselves. Well, a little bit after midnight, the phone rang, Donna picked it up and handed it to me, and the voice told me that the planes had crashed and that there were no survivors. So Donna and I collapsed, cried, and then I got up and realized I needed to call my family and call my boss, because in about six to eight hours, all the kids from my school were going to be showing up. So I... Um, I 
waited till all my family arrived, and then we planned a memorial service that we had in Colorado Springs on a Wednesday, and then by the end of the week, everybody had gone home, and I was alone in my house. This had run in the paper, but I was alone in my house, except not really, because I had Adam and Seth's dogs, Shoshi and Squeak. So every morning I had to get up and feed the dogs and walk them. I had a purpose, I had a reason to get up. And of course, I had another reason to get up, and that was that I had all of the kids at school. And I wanted to go back to school, school to show the kids that even when something really bad happens to you, you have to keep going. So I went back to school a week after the plane crash, and when I walked into my office, there was a little sticky note on my desk, and it said, in comes love, out goes sadness. And now you can see all the love that was coming in. Of course, I had kids coming in my office, and they were saying things like, Dr. Saltzman, I know how you feel because my grandma died. Or, Dr. Saltzman, I know how you feel because my dog died. And then when the kid came in and said, Dr. Saltzman, I know how you feel because my rat died, I thought, that's pushing it a little bit, okay? <laughs> but it was a great place for me to be, and it was also great for the kids to be able to ask me questions. They asked me about Adam and Seth. So it was really good for me to be able to be at school and feel like I was making a difference. Now, every day I had to leave school and go home, but I always had something to look forward to because every day I was getting hundreds of letters, and this is just one of them. It says, Dear Nancy, the smile of Seth, the understanding, smiling face of Adam when we were pulling Seth's leg about something. Seth's great laugh, Adam's ability to listen and comprehend with a maturity above his years. Oh, what wonderful kids. They had a compassion for people they surely got from their father. And of course, mom, ha ha. We all miss the greatness they were destined to become. And this letter meant so much to me, like so many of the others, because people told me stories about my kids, and it was just absolutely wonderful. Lasagna. Well, look at me. Do you think I eat a lot of lasagna? Well, everybody was bringing me lasagna or something to eat. So finally, I talked to the person coordinating the food, and I said, um, you know, I'm really not eating all this food, and I really don't need all this food. And she said, let me explain something to you. We can't do anything to make you feel better. We can't take away your pain. But if you let us cook for you, it helps us feel better, and we hope that it lets you know how much we're thinking about you. And I realized that we all need to do things like bring lasagna. Whether it's actually lasagna or a note or a phone call, it's really important to recognize that someone is going through a hard time. And lasagna is also a good thing to bring. So that was very helpful to me. Now, also, I was finishing a school year, because the crash had happened in September, and summer was coming up. And I knew I could work all summer long, but I also needed a distraction. So, <laughs> I took motorcycle riding lessons. My mother said, are you trying to kill yourself? And I'm like, yeah, uh, maybe I am. But I did learn how to ride a motorcycle, and then uh, I didn't ever ride it again after that, because I probably would have killed myself, which would not have been good. Also, I had incredible support of hundreds of people. Donna, who first came over to be with me that night, called me every day on the phone. My brother called me. I have teachers who supported me, and I have my high school friends came out to visit me. My colleagues were there to support me. There are people who have come into my life since the crash, single people who I had things to do with, and I just had a wonderful time being with all of these people, and they were great help. And of course, when Choshi died, I got another golden retriever, Macy, and I got a, when Squeak died, I got a little Schnauzer poodle, and so my dogs were there. I've always had dogs, I always have two, so I can keep rotating them through. <laughs> um, because that has also been a really important part of my recovery. And about eight years after the plane crash, a friend of mine said to me, I know a tall, dark, and handsome widower. Would you be interested in meeting him? His wife actually died of breast cancer. And I said, sure. So I met him. We dated almost 11 years, and we just got married in August. And so I was open to having love again. <laughs> so I will never get over losing Joel, Adam, and Seth. I have deep sadness 
from losing them. But I also have great joy from having had them in my life, which allowed me to fall in love again and have great joy again. And something else. I know that things can always get worse. Now, you probably think that's a crazy thing for me to say, but I have people come up to me all the time and they go, oh, I was having the worst day today and I saw you and I thought, oh my God, my life could be so much worse. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> but I do the same thing. I mean, I really do. I know everyone has a story to tell and I know we all are going to have to deal with hard things in our lives. And I hope what happened to me never happens to any of you, but the odds are that you will or will have already had something hard to deal with. So I hope that hearing my story helps you think about that and put things in perspective. Also, I believe in happy practice. I really do appreciate the little things in life, and I know that I don't have total control over my life, but I know I have some control over my life. And so I do look for the happy things in my life, and I surround myself with happy people because that's what helps me stay positive. I can keep a perspective. Thanks to Adam, every time I look at my car radio, I think I can keep a perspective. So I feel very lucky to be able to have happy practice. And Susan Zimmerman says, we have to go to the edge of all we have and take one more step. So thank you very much for listening to my story today. Thank you.